can stand up with us. We're going to get ready for worship. But before we do, I want to welcome you guys with, with the word of prayer. So be an attitude of prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for once again another day, God, to be able to come before your presence. God, to grace your throne with worship and praise, God. And we just ask that the worship that goes before you, God, opens up the platform for the word that will be spoken, Lord, and that it rests on good hearts, God, and the seed that are planted, God, that they grow. God, we know that some water, Lord, we know that some plant, some water, but it's you that get the increase. And God, we just thank you for the simple fact that you know each and every one of our names. And God, we'll forever give you all the glory, honor, and praise. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so grateful that Jesus knows each and every one of our names.
continue to lift up a song tonight because ever since the moment God knew us, he's loved us with an incredible love. How deep the Father's love for us. as a church, as a family of God, because that's what we are, right? New Spring Church. We are a family, part of God's bigger family, but we are a local family of believers who come together. But now the word local 
is tricky because as we stand here tonight and we sing, there are people all over this country and even all over the world that are joining you in worship tonight because of online. Now, now here's the thing. I love it when we can say in your face to Satan by using something he uses for bad stuff to do really cool stuff. So as we, as we celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the whole reason why we're here on a Wednesday night, I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in one more chorus of I love you, Lord. And, and as you sing it, I want you to think about the fact that it's not just us here in Wichita, Kansas. It's those who are in Nebraska and I Iowa and Idaho and, and California, um, potentially in other countries tonight. We are gathered together in the midweek in the middle of stress and work and all the other stuff that we're dealing with. And together as a family of Christ, we're saying, I love you, Lord. And all that I want right now on a Wednesday night is to sing a pleasing sound in your ear. That doesn't mean that you are a brilliant musician or singer. What that means is that when, when Jesus hears us Say, we love you, Father. It's that beautiful sound, just like when your kiddo comes up and climbs up in your lap and says, I love you, Dad. I love you, Mom. That's what this is about. Would you, would you sing it with us one more time? Jacqueline, y'all can go ahead and have a seat. This is the time of our service where we're going to celebrate the Lord together in communion. The reason we call it communion, by the way, it's not just a pretty name for the Lord's Supper. We call it communion because this is a time where we are supposed to be talking to God. Now, we talk to God all the time in prayer, but this is a special time to talk to God. You know, the Bible says that when we take the Lord's Supper, it is a time for us to look into our heart and to say, where do I stand with the Lord right now? And to talk to him about it. It's an opportunity to get right. It's an opportunity to see oppor opportunities in our Christian walk. I used to wonder, I'd be a kid, and we had a very traditional church at the time when I was a kid, and, and communion was a very somber, sober, quiet, down kind of time. And I would ask my dad, I would say, why is it so like that? And he would say, well... So part of it could be the tradition of, and at that time, tradition certainly impacted it. But he said, Jonathan, it's a time to take things seriously. It's a time to take your walk with God seriously. And say, God, there, there's an old hymn we used to sing. I don't know, any of y'all remember that? We used to sing a, a, a hymn that said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Because sometimes I don't even know my heart, right? Sometimes I don't even know what needs to be cleaned, what needs to be refreshed, what needs to be spruced up. I don't know the remodeling God knows, needs to do. I just know there's a lot of remodeling in there to do. When he saved me, he saved a fixer-upper. My wife will attest to that. So this is a time when we say, God, search me and know my heart. As the psalmist said, see if there's any wicked way in me. Help turn me down the right path. I, I'm clear that it's easy enough for me. As much as I want to follow God, it's easy for me to go down a wrong road. And I know that every mile I cover in a wrong direction, I'm going to have to cover going back the other way. And I'm saying, God, please, please help me make sure I'm right right now. Now, quickly, one of the things that Jesus told us about the Lord's Supper is that we're supposed to do it in a certain mode mentally. That we're supposed to take the Lord's Supper, the Bible, the, Jesus said, in remembrance of me. So, you know, at the old church, we used to have a big communion table that said, in remembrance of me on the front of it. Like all Baptist churches had a thing on the front, in remembrance of me. I used to read it when I'd get bored in a sermon, read it over and over and over and over again. 
why does Jesus say we need to remember him? Because there are certain things that are not hard to remember because they're on our mind all the time. The stress from work, the diagnosis you just got, the diagnosis you think you might be getting ready to get, so you keep checking your email every 30 minutes to see if the hospital has emailed you or if the doctor has emailed you or if the test results are in. You know as well as I do, you walk around with that hanging over your head the whole time. It's not hard to remember. But in those moments, to remember our Lord and Savior that walks with you through it. To remember that there was a person who laid his life down on a Roman cross and said, there is nothing that will ever, ever separate you from me ever again. Never, 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 never. You are never going to be separated from me ever again. That's what we're remembering tonight. And the Bible says they did eat and they did drink. Father, you have given us more than we could ever ask for to be adopted into a family we don't deserve to be in, to be loved in a way we don't deserve to be loved, and to be a conduit of your love in a world that is so broken and so hurting. Father, energize us tonight, encourage us as we talk tonight about being healed by your love and being healed at your word, at your spoken word, being healed of the things that are broken in our lives. Father, help us to be encouraged and energized and excited about what you're going to do in and through us individually and as a church in these last days. And we will give you every bit of credit because not a single bit of it belongs to us. All the glory belongs to Jesus. And we will celebrate you in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, it's a special night tonight. We got a lot of uh, our kid worship team is in the room. Make some noise if you're part of the kids worship team. Yes, 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 I see you guys. I hear you guys. If y'all were at the night of worship, those were the people at the New Spring in the Park. You saw them down in the front. It was the time that all of the cameras came out and people flooded the front. I said, what's about to happen? Oh, kids worship team, that's right. (laughs) Thought we were just doing that good. Nope, not true, all right. Y'all go ahead and stand up with us. And for all the parents of these young worship leaders in the room, I I want you to lead your families in worship and all the kids on the kids worship team, I want you to lead your parents in worship right now to this next song, because I truly believe this. I believe I'm a fixer upper too. When you ask me what qualifies me, It's only through the blood of Jesus that I can say Why you ever chose me, Lord Will always be a mystery, I know All my life I've been told I belong here At the end of the line With all the other not quite With all the never get it right But it turns out to the ones you've been looking for All this time I say that I'm just a nobody Brought a rock to a sword fight You picked 12 outsiders Nobody would have chosen And you changed the world With the moral of the stories That everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that devil Start talking to me saying Who do you think you are? I just tell him I'm just a nobody Oh! 
See Miss Debbie. We're gonna head out, but for the rest of you, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Jonathan, thank you, for, thank you for uh, bringing this word tonight for us, brother. Hey, everybody! I am so excited to be here, and I, this is, feels very new to me. I've never preached in this room before, so I'm very excited. Right? Very excited. Let me take these off so I can see you guys a little better. So I have a question for you, just to kind of get us started, and that is this: Have you ever been asked a question that has an obvious answer? This is so frustrating to me, right? Because I'm all about questions, but, you know, a question with an obvious answer. And I do this too. I did this to my wife the other day. We have a routine, a regular thing that happens every morning in the Hoover household. My, my oldest daughter is now old enough to drive herself to school every morning, which is, I'm, I know I don't look that old. I appreciate you saying that, that I don't look old enough to have a daughter who drives to school every morning. You're right, of course, I do look very young. But what I'm saying, though, is my, my youngest daughter, though, my wife still takes her to school every morning, and it's just kind of the routine that they have. And, and this is every morning in the Hoover household. This is how it goes. And Wendy's making sure that Summer has breakfast and all the stuff that she needs to do, and everything is all set up. And, and uh, you know, she, she goes ahead and says, all right, now, sweetheart, you go out and get in the car. And m- my wife has picked up her lunchbox and her, her trumpet for band, and she's headed out the door, and she says, all right, I'm taking off. And I say, you taking Summer to school? Of course she's taking Summer to school. That's what she does every single morning, right? But, but the time when you're going to get asked the most obvious question of all time, we just had the other night. It was Halloween, right? Um, and you know when you're trick-or-treating, this is when the most obvious question gets asked in the world. I know this from growing up. You know, you get, as a little boy, you get a Batman costume because Batman's cool. And you've got the Batman pants with the painted-on Batman belt thing, belt buckle, right? And you've got the Batman shirt, and it says, Batman. Across the shirt, and you've got the little weird helmet thing on that has the little, I don't know, I'm not a Batman person. Are they ears? What are they? I don't, I don't get the little thing, right? You go up, and there is guaranteed to be at least one person, at least one. You go to the door, you ring the doorbell, and what do they come to the door and ask? Who are you supposed to be? Isn't it obvious? Superman, you know? Um, but... There was a time in the scripture that Jesus asked what, in my mind, or at least what seems to me to be like the most, a question with the most obvious answer, patently obvious answer. Jesus asked this question. It's like there was no reason for him to ask the question. It doesn't seem like there was reason for him to ask the question. But it is such a powerful moment. There, there's so much wrapped in this, in this little story about the way that God heals us, about the way that God meets us in our brokenness to heal us. How many of us could testify to the fact that God has a special way of meeting us in our brokenness? There is a, you know, when, when we do grief ministry, we teach people that the brokenness that they feel as they come in is, first of all, it is normal, that it's normal to feel broken when we grieve. Secondly, it's not forever. It's going to change over time. But the third thing we teach them is that God will meet you while you're broken. And, and he will do it in a way that is somehow special. The scripture tells us that God is close to the brokenhearted. So there is a way in which he's close to people who are needing healing more than he's close to anybody else ever, ever. So we're going to talk a little bit about this by going to the story and just talking about what, what can we learn about this moment where Jesus asked what seemed to be a very, very obvious question. And this is in John chapter 5. If you happen to have your Bible with you, we're going to stay there most of the time. Or if you have your phone and you like to read uh, off of your, your phone, that's fine too. In John chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, or that's just another word for porches. So there were five porches at different levels, and then there was a sort of covered area. And here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. 
And one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, by the way, this is not right. So I'm telling you up front, this is not how God views people. But I am telling you that in the ancient world, there was a sort of dividing of people into able-bodied, whole, physically non-disabled individuals and people who had some sort of physical ailment or issue such that there was almost a sense in which people who had some sort of ailment like that were not considered completely whole. They weren't considered a whole person. And so there was this sort of looking down on... This is something, by the way, that is so interesting about Jesus. Jesus was so frequently in areas where people who would have been considered not just broken in terms of their lifestyle, but broken physically. God was hanging out there when no other Jewish teacher most likely would have been hanging out in those areas. What are the things that we love about Jesus? Not only that we have... uh, That in the Bible, we find out that God is a loving father. We also know that God goes to where the broken people are. That, that our God is not someone who expects broken people to come to where he is. Our God goes to where the broken people are. And in this case, you have these individuals who are lame and paralyzed and blind. And I want you to notice the word that is used here, the word invalid. We don't use that word. Because it has a bad connotation, doesn't it? That somehow this person, because of their physical condition, is an invalid individual. You're actually going to see here in a minute that even the Apostle John, as he is writing this, will use the term invalid to describe this person because there is a human hang-up that goes, if a person has some sort of bodily issue or incapability, then somehow they are less than. And this person that we are talking about had been less than an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked them what seems like a question with an incredibly obvious answer, do you want to get well? Why does it seem like an obvious question? Well, if you have a King James Version or a New King James Version, you will notice that as you're reading along with me, there is a good little segment about two sentences that is not in my translation, it's not in most modern translations. And the reason is because we believe that a scribe added this in sometime later as an explanation, but um, scribes' markings in Scripture do not rise to the level of Scripture. It's why it's been taken out over the years. However, the marking is important. It does tell us something about the ancient world, and we do have other writings that back this up, that people that were going to the Pool of Bethesda there was a sort of bubbling up or stirring of the waters that would happen from time to time. Now, we don't know whether that was from a hot spring kind of thing going on or whether it was what people believed. And people believed that it was an angel of God coming down into the water and stirring up the water. And they believed that whoever got into the water first would be healed of whatever their sickness or illness was. This guy had been coming to the pool of Bethesda for a long time in the hopes that at some point when the water would get stirred up, he would get down into the water and he would not be an invalid anymore. He wouldn't be broken anymore. He would have a normal life. He'd probably been doing this for some time. So to ask somebody who is, who, who, who is lame or who has some sort of... We're not exactly sure. I think we can assume from the story that he was lame because it seems like it was very important that, that Jesus would eventually have him walk but let's, let's say that's the case. It is interesting to go up to a lame person who is at Bethesda. Why do people go to Bethesda? So they can get in the water, so that they can get healed, so that they won't have this physical issue anymore. And Jesus walks up to him and says, do you want to be well? Well, it seems like it has an obvious answer. Not only is it obvious, but what I want you to see is that as far as this guy is concerned, it's impossible. It is the obvious impossible thing that hangs over his head every stinking day of his life. It's the thing that is just outside his grasp. I can't do it. It's not working for me. I want to be healed, and I'll do anything that I can to be healed, but it's just not happening. And I'm wondering who I'm talking to in the room, that there is something in your life that you would say, this is the obvious thing. This is the obvious barrier I can't get past but I also know it is the impossible barrier in my life. It is the obvious impossible barrier. It is the thing that I carry with me everywhere I go, and it is also the thing that I cannot get past. No matter what I do, it's there with me all the time. If you have that in your, in your mind, what is that obvious impossible barrier in your life? That is what he is up against. Can I show you what he said? 
If you have a translation that starts with, now keep in mind, Jesus said, do you want to be well? If you have a translation that starts with him saying, I can't, sir, that's probably the best translation. But here I have the NIV. It says, uh, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Well, there's a lot embedded in that statement. He's saying, first of all, I can't get well. Truth is, I'm here, and I come here every day but it's not going to happen for me. And you know one of the reasons why it's not going to happen? Because people that used to be there for me aren't there for me anymore. They, oh, they drop me off here at the pool, and then they wave, and they leave, and it's just me by myself. And I sit here, and I wait for the water to bubble up, but nobody's here to help me. Nobody's here to get me over there. And then when it happens, you know what? Seems like it's always the other person. Seems like it's the person who's in front of me. Somehow it's always somebody else. I don't know if, I don't know if this is touching on a raw spot for anybody, but I don't know if I'm talking to somebody here who would say the obvious impossible thing in my life, it seems like it's always the other person that gets past it. It's always the other person that gets out of debt. It's always the other person whose marriage miraculously turns around. It's always the other person who somehow gets it spiritually, but I'm still struggling. For some reason, it's always the other person that gets there, but I can never get there. There were certain things that he had come to know were indicators that healing wasn't possible. One is the time. Time told him that it wasn't possible. 38 years? 38 years is a long time. And in case we need to like ground ourselves in how long 38 years is, did you know that, that 38 years ago we ended up with Nintendo? <laughs> so this is a familiar picture to you. That has been in your life for 38 years. 38 years is when Chicken McNuggets entered our life. Before 38 years ago, there were no Chicken McNuggets. 38 years ago, caffeine-free Coke. Or... Microsoft Word. How many used Microsoft Word this week at some point in time? Did you know there was no Microsoft Word before 38 years ago? No Hot Pockets. Some of y'all just like, some of y'all are younger than 38 and being like, that's why I wasn't born until then. God knew not to send me into the world until Hot Pockets were on the planet. Once Hot Pockets were there, he said, all right, and they can get born now. You know. Now, here's what I would encourage you to think about. Isn't it true? Is it not true that when you look at these things, it's almost like you're like, you know, it's just like they've always been there. They've been there long enough that now it's just kind of like they've always been there. That's what it felt like to be this guy. He'd been broken so long, he didn't remember what it was like to not be broken. He didn't remember what it was like before this happened, before his life was like this. Who am I talking to in this room? Don't raise your hand. But who am I talking to in this room who would say, I don't remember what my life was like before I had an anger problem. I don't remember life before insecurity. I'm an insecure person. That's just who I am. I, I, you know, I, 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 I feel like I'm not good enough, but then because I feel like I'm not good enough, I start criticizing other people, and I start nitpicking other people, and, and you know, I, I kind of belittle them, and then they pull away from me because they don't want to be around me, and when they pull away from me, I feel like I'm even more not good enough, and then I get even more upset, and we end up in this cycle. But Jonathan, that's who I am. That's who I've always been. That's not going to change. It's like it's always been there. So when we talk about this guy at the pool of Bethesda, 38 years, I mean, this was his identity now. He was an invalid. Some of you in this room, you would, if we printed up a badge, you would wear it. I'm a person with an anger problem. I'm a person who can't keep my finances in line. I'm a person who can't get along with my kid. I'm a person who doesn't get along with other people. I'm an insecure person. I'm a person who tends to be irresponsible, impulsive sometimes. We're humble enough to own it, but at the same time, there's another part of us that goes, that's how I've always been, and that, that's not going to change. That's just how it is. It was his identity. Look at this. Even the apostle John, the invalid, replied. He just wants you to know who's talking. It was the invalid. That was his identity. By the way, no disrespect to John, but sometimes the church is just as quick as anybody else to let someone's brokenness become their identity. God help us never to be a church that identifies people by their brokenness, that we understand that we were broken too, and we are still broken, but it is the blood of Jesus Christ 
that allows us to live a whole life and not to be an invalid. We are validated by the love of Jesus Christ. I'm not validated because of who I am. I'm not validated because of who my family is, because of what my job is, because of what I do, because of what I can do, because of my education, because of the wonderful blessings God has given me. I am validated for one reason and one reason only, and that is Jesus Christ cared enough about my brokenness to enter my world and do something about it. It was his identity. There's this, there's this feeling that seeps into our lives that says, things that have been this way this long don't change. And people will tell me that in my office. You know, I've been this way a long time. People that have been this way this long don't change. They do if Jesus gets in the picture. And you know why? Because Jesus is not the medicator Jesus is not the tweaker. He is not the improver. He is the transformer. He can take what was this and turn it into that. He can take what was not and turn it into what is. He created this planet. He can recreate you. It's feasible. So time said it wasn't possible. Second thing is people concluded it wasn't possible. Like I said, he says, I have no one. There is a time where people will participate in trying to help you through your brokenness, but have you also noticed there is a time in which people start to check out? And you know, I think that's maybe kind of normal. There's, there's boundaries, right? So if I, if, if I am betraying someone's trust, there's going to come a point at which they cannot continue to try to help rehabilitate me if I'm continuing to break their trust. There's a human thing where we have to set boundaries. However, what I want, what I want you to know is that while other people may have finally drawn a line and say, I can't walk forward anymore with you, just because you are by yourself does not mean that God cannot do something that others will not do for you right now. The others wouldn't come with him to the pool of Bethesda. They wouldn't sit with him at the pool of Bethesda. They wouldn't wait for the water to bubble up. They'd seen it happen before and nothing seemed to work. They were convinced that nothing was going to work for this guy. They had more or less assumed this lame guy is going to be a lame guy for the rest of his life. Isn't that how it works anyway? Isn't that what we've always seen? We've always seen that people that are lame stay lame for the rest of their life. People don't change. Leave him leave alone. But friend, if you believe in Jesus Christ, even if people leave you alone, you are not alone. Even if somebody abandons you, you are not abandoned. Even if somebody checks out on you, you are not by yourself. Because you take the spirit of the living God with you everywhere that you go. And that is better than a stadium of friends. Because he can do what they cannot. The situation indicated that it wasn't possible. He says, well, I'm trying to get in. Somebody else always gets down ahead of me. He says, I physically, literally, practically cannot do what the situation requires of me to get better. Oh, my gosh. When when my wife and I um, were in our really early marriage, I decided to go to automotive tech school. And I know what you think. Of course, Jonathan, you look like a mechanic. I I get that. Um, and because I'm a 0%, 100% kind of person, it's either I'm, I'm either all in or all out. I wanted to go to the best automotive school in the entire country. I wanted, to, I wanted to peg it out. And I spent a fortune that I did not have to spend. And we went in huge student debt for a mechanics certificate. And for years, that debt would hang over my head like a cloud. Thankfully, we don't the Lord has, has blessed us, and we don't have that hanging over our head these days, but it, for years it would break me. And I would feel like, I, I would listen to people who were financially really smart, and I would listen to them tell me what we needed to do to deal with it, and I would say, you don't understand. I cannot even get to step one of what you just said. The, the process to get myself out of trouble, I can't even get... The process started. I I can't even get to the first step of it. And I think that's what this guy is saying. He's like, look, I'm supposed to be able to get healed by getting in the water, but I can't even get there faster than the person in front of me. Practically, it can't work. But he kept showing up. So you got to give him this. There was a part of him that knew somehow 
somehow there's got to be a way to not live this broken life that I've been living. Somehow. And, and here's the deal. It's clear that the people who went to the pool of Bethesda were still seeking out God, were they not? They believed that it was an angel of God who would come down and stir the waters, and that would be what would heal somebody. This was as close as he knew how to get to try to get to God because there was a part of him saying, I know that somehow there's got to be a way out of this. I'm wondering who I'm talking to in this room who would say, Jonathan, at least I still have that. Time doesn't seem to be on my side. Other people, doesn't, they don't seem to be on my side. Practically, I don't see my way out of this, but at least there is still a seed in my heart that says, surely there's got to be some way of getting past this. Because I think that's where this guy was. Now, do you want to see what Jesus said to him? So keep in mind here, let's, let's, let's rewind the tape and just make sure that we're up to speed on what's happened here. So you have Jesus saying, do you want to be well? And he says, I can't, and here's all the reasons why. And now Jesus is going to address, address him. And, and he's going to skip past all those reasons and check this out. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. Well, like, like a lot of stories in the Gospels, that happened kind of fast, didn't it? At least it's not Mark. Mark was written by Peter, I'm pretty sure. And Peter was ADHD like me. And, and, and at least and with Mark, everything happened right away. And then the very next thing was this. And then we did this. And then it was like, I mean, it's just a little overwhelming. A lot going on really quickly. You know, John's a little slower pace. But even then, stuff happens really fast. Let's take a minute and deconstruct. What can we learn from this encounter that this man had with Jesus? I do not know how to simplify the statement that I'm getting ready to put up on the screen. I worked it over and over again, tried to make it shorter, but I just didn't know how to do it, so you'll have to forgive me for this. My own solution to my brokenness will become a focal point of my own failure to fix myself. My solution to my brokenness will become a focal point of my own failure to fix myself. See, the thing about it was, Jesus, the amazing miracle worker, is standing in front of him. And he says, do you want to be well? What does he say to Jesus? My plan isn't working. But still in his head, his plan is the only plan. The only way I could get better is to get into the water. I'm talking to somebody here who feels like the only way that you could make it past the barrier is if you got another degree. Or the only way that you could make it past the barrier is if your spouse would straighten up and be a decent person. Or some of you feel like the only way I could get past this is if my kid would come to their senses and quit being a moron. Or some, somebody's like, you know, the only way that I'm going to be able to get past this barrier is if X, Y, Z, and you've got it all planned out. This is how this will happen, and then this domino will fall, and then this domino will fall, and then maybe, if I'm really fortunate and everything goes just as planned, I will finally get to where I need to be. Can I tell you something? Jesus can skip you forward all the way to the end. It does not have to go according to your plan. But the more you get absorbed in your plan, the more you are going to have your nose rubbed in your own failure to fix what is broken about you. But if you could fix what was broken about you, you would have done it a long time ago. Jesus can skip straight to the point. My solution is not the answer. I used to love a song written by Andre Crouch that says, Jesus is the answer. It's a little boy in church, Sunday school. My dad used to tell the story when I was a kid. I inventory a lot of pastor stories growing up, a third generation pastor, but there was a time when Sunday school was kind of like elementary school. They would teach lessons. There was almost like a pop quiz after every once in a while. Like I, I had a couple Sunday school teachers that were like this. And so the, the teacher is kind of going through, making sure the kid understood the lesson and said, now, now, Billy, now, who parted the Red Sea, you know? And, and little, boy, little Billy looked up and said, well, that was Jesus. No, Billy, I'm sorry. That was very close, though. No, that was Moses. But um, it, no, 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 no. Pastor said, in church, the answer is always Jesus, you know. <laughs> Historically, I'm not 100% sure that's true, but theologically, little Billy has a good point. 
See, I'm talking to somebody in this room. You say, Jonathan, you know, the sermon is not really so much for me as I think, some, I think it's for somebody that I know and they're really going through a season of brokenness and they're really feeling the pain of it and they've tried to plan everything out and it's not working for them. Can I tell you the answer is not their solution. The answer is Jesus. And the best thing you can do is be a flesh and blood extension of Jesus Christ in their life. Show them the love of Christ. Be a person who demonstrates for them what the Christ life is about and see what happens. Jesus gave him three instructions. I, I think I have time to go over this. So just really quickly, more than the idea that hopefully you'll take home tonight, the idea that it doesn't have to be your solution. It's got to be Jesus' solution. But one other thing that I never saw before in the story, and I wanted to make sure we covered it, Jesus gives him three instructions. The first instruction he gives him is get up. After Jesus heals him, he says, get up. What, mean, what that means is you have a new identity. So you've taken on the identity of an invalid, but now you have a new identity, so you need to get up. You don't need to keep acting like a person who's broken because that is not who you are anymore. You are whole. Get up and start your new life. You know the Bible talks about how a person who is in Christ becomes a new creature. How many of us have read that passage? A person who becomes in Christ is a new creature. How many of us have been freaked out by that passage? Because we know that we still have struggles. We still in many ways are the same old person that we were before. We deal with temptations and issues and it's like, oh my gosh, I hope I really am a child of God because I don't feel like I'm completely new. This is what is so important. What that passage is talking about is that you have a new identity. If you keep reading past that verse, it says that all of this is of God. So it's not what you do to change who you are. It is what God does to adopt you into his family. It is not that you have now fundamentally changed your personality. You have changed your family. You are now in God's family. You were lost and out to sea, but now God has adopted you and you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are a completely different person, not because suddenly you, you seem different, but because you have been placed, you have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and transported into the kingdom of light, and God's righteousness like a coat covers you because of the blood of Jesus Christ, and now when God looks at you, he sees Jesus' record and not yours. He's saying, you don't need to lay down anymore. It's time to get up and live in your new identity. What would our lives be if we were actually living into who we are in Jesus Christ and really absorbed in the fact that I now am a child of God. And we're so used to hearing that. It's in and out, the, it's in and out of the ears because people have used that as a religious cliche. It is not a religious cliche. It is who you are. Are you're a child of God, you belong to his family. That is huge, that is monumental, and it will never change. It's time to get up. The book of 1 Corinthians. Paul Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth, it's kind of like two casts of like two MTV reality shows get saved and start a church. Like and it's messy, and they have all kinds of weird questions, like for Paul, about stuff that church people wouldn't ask. And Paul's got to be very, like, starting from scratch with them about the Christian life, which is kind of good because we need somebody to start from scratch with us about the Christian life. So we peek in on some very straight talk that Paul gives the church at Corinth. But in the process, he says this, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And check this out. And that is what some of you were. Oh, I'm not even going to comment on that. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, that's who you were. And there's going to be a part of that that you still struggle with. And that's going to be a cross that you carry every day to try to align yourself with a holy God when there is still an unholy part of you. But I want you to know that in essence, when God looks at you, you are washed, you are justified, you are sanctified. Now, what does it mean to be justified? When you have that Microsoft Word document open and you're working on it, we talk about left justifying or right justifying. It means that we have aligned everything up where it should be. It is all in alignment. It is against the standard. It fits the standard. So when God justifies us, 
says, he takes the ragged edge of the weirdness that we are and aligns us with God's holy son and so that we now are living in alignment with our purpose and with our creator. We can't do that. That is a God thing. Jesus can change who you are. I'm sure this is grammatically incorrect, but it's true. Jesus can change who you are. So somebody may tell you, you've always been this way, and this is how you're always going to be. And they tell you that you're like this, you're, this is how you do it, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know what you can tell them? Well, you know what? Jesus can change that. Don't you tell them that you can, because you can't. If somebody says, you're hypercritical. Well, they might be right, they might not be. Certainly they're criticizing you at that moment, but let's try to stick with the facts. <laughs> Don't you tell them, well, I'll try to change that. Because you know what? You'll fail. You know what you can tell them? Well, you know what? Jesus could change that. If somebody says, you know what? You have an anger problem. You know what? Jesus could change that. You know what? You're, you're difficult to be around sometimes. Well, Jesus could change that. That's what it means to have a relationship with Jesus is that we are with somebody who can recreate the person that we are. What about the people who think you can't change? And there's probably some of those. The disciples were listening to Jesus talk about money. And they heard him talk about how hard it is for a rich person to get into heaven. Jesus is trying to make sure people understand that if what you trust in life is money, heaven is probably not your destination. But in the process, they get wigged out because they're worried that somehow this means they're not going to heaven or that people in general aren't going to heaven. And they say, well, who can be saved? I love this because there is not just an eternal salvation element of this, but really the question is, who can be redeemed? Who among the broken, crazy people that we are can be redeemed? And check out what Jesus says. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Do you know what the number one indicator of how powerful God is, is that he can take a broken mess like Jonathan Hoover and he could do something with him? God can do something with a broken person like me. What about my impossible situation? Just another verse that communicates the same thing. Luke 137, for nothing will be impossible with God. Here's the deal. I cannot dictate that God will do the impossible. But when God dictates the impossible, it happens. When God speaks the impossible, it materializes. Jesus' second instruction is this, pick up your mat. What does that mean? It means your old limitations are not the boss of you anymore. friends over the years who've been constrained to a wheelchair. And that wheelchair sort of dictates some terms to them. You can't go up this set of stairs because the wheelchair won't let you do that. You can't fit into this space because the wheelchair won't let you do that. By the way, one of the beautiful things about that is that there is going to come a day on the other side of glory where, a person, where that person is never going to have a wheelchair dictate to them any terms for the rest of their life. But it is true that on this earth, if you are in a wheelchair, when I, I had crutches after I had open knee surgery a few years ago, and some of y'all were here at the time, I came out and preached. Now, you know, I typically like to do what I'm doing right now, which is pace nervously back and forth the entire time, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I couldn't pace because I was on crutches and I was hobbling around. Those crutches dictated to me that I couldn't do that. So I had to sit there, just sit there nervously the whole time. <laughs> that mat had dictated where this person could be what he could do, that mat was a symbol of the brokenness of his life and a symbol of the leash that that brokenness had around his neck. And now Jesus is saying, it used to be the boss of you, but now you're the boss of it. See, that's the thing. You, you may have a financial problem. And it may be something where you're like, I gotta learn how to do this differently. I gotta learn how to, how to spend money wisely. I gotta learn how to do these things differently. And the thing about it is, God wants you to know it does not have to be the boss of you. You can be the boss of it. My dad, I've never known my dad to have an anger problem. My entire life, I've never known my dad to be an angry person. But my grandparents, my, my dad's parents, tell me that there was a time when he really struggled with anger. And my dad has told me that what turned the corner for him, this was, would have been when I was an infant, he read a book by Tim LaHaye called Anger is a Choice. I give it away all the time. I keep copies of it in my office. They don't have it at any of the local bookstores. I have to order it in from online. But I, I give it away because my dad told me what a profound difference it made in his life. And he told me the other day, we were talking about this, and he said, you know what, what was so powerful about the book is it told me that I had a choice. That book told my dad, anger does not have to be the boss of you. You can be the boss of that anger. Pick up your mat 
It's not the boss of you anymore. You're the boss of it. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you what? Slaves. I don't have to be a slave to that anymore. Maybe you grew up in a home where there was a poison tongue pandemic in the home that you grew up in. And so you still have the symptoms of that illness. And it happens and it pops up at the least uh, opportune times. And you say things that you wish you could take back. That does not have to be the boss of you. You could be the boss of it. Doesn't mean you'll be perfect tomorrow. But it may be time to pick up that mat. And to say, I have a new identity. So it's not the boss of me anymore. And then finally, the last instruction was walk. And that means with God's help, you can do what you never thought possible. 38 years of pretty much knowing you're never going to walk again. At that point, you've pretty much decided my life doesn't involve walking. Some of you in this room would say, my life doesn't involve being an involved grandparent. My life doesn't involve, some of you guys in this room, my life doesn't involve being romantic. I'm just not that kind of guy. I don't have that personality. I mean, when I talk about romance in some of the married events that we have, it's like I see beads of sweat building up on guys' foreheads, you know? But with God's help, you can do what you never thought possible. You say, Jonathan, if you knew what kind of a parent I grew up with, I've done the best that I can to move the needle, but I'm never going to be the kind of parent that I know I should be. With God, there are things that you can do that you would not even think that you could do right now because you've never seen it. It's never happened for you before. And until you lean into what God is doing, you'll never know how far you could go with it. The Bible says this. This is in Ephesians 5. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Now, the reason that I'm using this passage is because there's somebody in the room that would say, you know what, Jonathan, this walking part, that's the hardest part because I just don't know that I'm ready to do what I have never done before when there's no pattern for me. There is no, there is no track laid down on that path for me to do something that is different than what I've always done. The scripture is very clear. What you do is you just try to follow God's example as best you can. You used to go fishing in a place where there were a lot of snakes, and I am not a snake person. And I know there's, there's snake people in the room, but so whenever I say the only, snake, the only good snake is a dead snake, they get really mad at me. So I'm not going to say that tonight. I'm going to avoid saying that completely. It's true, though. Um, and I would be so scared that I would walk up on one of those snakes, and my dad would say, just step in the footprints that follow me and step in the big prints that my feet make. What is God saying? Yeah, is it, is it intimidating to pick up your mat and walk a new path when you've never walked before? When you've never done it this way before and it's completely challenging and scary and different and gosh, how am I going to be able to do this? It is, but you just walk in the big footprints that God leaves before you. And you say, I'm going to follow those as best I can. I'm going to get lost sometimes. I'm going to get off track sometimes. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to be perfect. God knows that. The blood of Jesus Christ covers my imperfection. But in the meantime, I'm going to try to step where he steps. And you know what? He's only going to give you one step at a time. So you just stay as close as you can. And you follow it one step at a time. One footprint at a time. Can I ask you a question as we close out? Because I really want you to workshop this in your own life. I'm doing that in my life. Can I ask you a question? What is the obvious, impossible situation in your life right now that needs Jesus? What is the impossible, obvious situation in your child's life right now that needs Jesus? What's the obvious, impossible situation right now in your coworker's life that needs Jesus? I'm going to pray right now. I'm just going to ask for a huge portion of God's love and compassion as we get up, pick up our mat, and walk. Father, you are a great big God, able to take us far beyond what we think is possible, able to guide us step by step where we need to go. Help us to get up, not to be grounded in the old identity that is 
that is typified by dysfunction, but rather to recognize that our new identity in you is not just functional, it is miraculous. And Father, help us to pick up that mat, to be the boss of the things that used to be the boss of us, and to walk in your footsteps. Help us to be salt and light in this crazy world that we live in, to show people that you are the way. We don't need our solution, we need Jesus. We thank you for all that you're going to do in our lives and in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We'll see you this weekend.